five seconds to submergence. Submergence deep into the absurd. E pluribus unum. Out of many, one. That is, um, that's the the Latin phrase that we see on every quarter in the United States. Um, it's kind of the, well, it's our, uh, it's our national motto for the United States. It's uh, out of many, one. Out of many peoples, out of many nations, one. One United States of America. <laughs> As if we're all united as if us many individuals with so many different beliefs and thoughts and ideas about the world as if we can all be united in many ways i think i think we are as a country i think the united states is very much united i mean it looks divided but i mean you walk places you know you walk around and people are People are friendly, right? I mean, maybe not everyone, but I, I don't think it's as disastrous as they make it out to seem. But, but of course, in this podcast, I am going <laughs> to make it out to look pretty, pretty damn disastrous. Um, this is an episode on David Foster Wallace's essay, E Unibus Plurum. Out of one, many, uh, with the subtitle of television and U.S. fiction, it is sort of a an analysis on television and U.S. fiction up to the early 1990s when this was written. While being kind of now, this all came out before. Before smartphones, before social media, before Siri, before Alexis. Before you could broadcast yourself away on YouTube or before uh, I could come to you on this podcast, right? Just some random 23-year-old dude um, on his computer reading books and telling you what's up. So it it might seem outdated, but... But when you dive into it, it really uh, it's really foretelling on the effects of, for one, television and as well, social media. Of course, it doesn't mention social media, but it does mention the effects of watching things, of, uh, of being watched, of, of projecting yourself into the web, into other people's screens talks about the perils of uh, everyone looking at the same things, right? Now, I won't give away at present what E Unibus Plurum means, but we'll go into that later. And I'm sure maybe you'll start to unravel it as you follow along. And I was, uh, hopefully there's some of you, I just want to do some housekeeping for a minute or house cleaning, whatever you want to call it. So if you are interested in, say, giving me some feedback, giving the podcast some feedback, uh, at requesting things to come on the show, just shoot me an email or say, I, I'm pretty sure on the website there's a contact contact link. You know, you can uh, type your first name or whatever. And then put your email down, say your message, and press go. If there are any suggestions, uh, feel free to do that. Without without any uh, other announcements, let's just get right into it. So he starts off with, uh, it's kind of divided into sections, but the first section is act natural. Act natural. And kind of as a brief overview, he's talking about how actors, um, quote-unquote, act natural. 
when they're acting, right? But but in reality, people just aren't how actors act, right? People in real life are not anywhere close to how actors act, right? Sure, maybe you'll get the occasional good actor, right? That's that's uh, uh, puts on a pretty good convincing performance, right? But at the end of the day, television, it's just, uh, it's illusion on top of illusion on top of illusion, right? Uh, you you want to be fooled that it's it's really happening, that you're seeing something that's real, right? And so act act natural, right? So he, he kind of starts off with saying how fiction writers are auguries. He, he kind of makes a case study on the, the fiction writer. And he is, David Foster Wallace, he is a fiction writer. So in a sense, I kind of take it as, oh, he's, he's kind of writing about himself here, right? So he, he says that fiction writers are oglers, as in they, they like to look at things. They like to look at people. They're, they're people watchers. And with that being said, they're, they're terribly self-conscious. They, they themselves don't like to be looked at, right? And they kind of, when, when they're looking at people, they're kind of acting as a psychologist, in a sense, they're projecting their own judgments kind of upon themselves. So, uh, you know, they'll, they'll judge people and they're judging people because there's this, there's this uh, inert self-consciousness within them. You know, they don't want to be looked at, but, and, and yet they're looking at everyone else, right? And with that said, the, the fiction writer, they, they like, they prefer solitude over being in public, Right? And back before television, you know, you'd have to, if you're a fiction writer and, and say you're an ogler, then you probably either ogle by people watching in public or reading books, right? But now, the fiction writer doesn't have to go outside. They don't have to go and look at people to see, okay, like, how, are, how do people act, right? How do people act and how can I learn from how people act in order to write more realistic stories, right? So instead of going outside to go and, say, people watch or meet people or learn how people act, they just stay at home and watch the television. And with that said, the, the fiction writer watches a lot of TV, which limits their socialness while also ensuring that they themselves will not be watched and instead, they can watch others while not being disturbed. So, uh, so Wallace kind of says that this this creates a sort of distorted perception of reality, which then cyclically reproduces, or is cyclically reproduced when the fiction writer writes their fiction. Um, so the so the fiction writer they're kind of in this this bubble. Right, they're in this this echo chamber. So when they're looking at people on the television, they're thinking, "Oh, yeah, this is a, you know, a uh, this is how people are." In a sense, you know, obviously they know that people aren't exactly like the people on TV, but but they are kind of sort of picking up on, "Oh, this is how people should be written. This is how I should write them." Right, but it's it's a distorted perception of reality, right? So with that said, Wallace says that we can, from, from there, compare the fiction writer to the average American fantasizer, which is almost everybody and anybody. And I think what he means by that is, well, I mean, exactly what he says, right? I mean, uh, everyone in America, I mean, this is the land where dreams come true, the land of opportunity. Americans are dreamers. We are. I mean, that's just that's in our that's in our whole history, right? That we're dreamers. That this is the land of opportunity, the place to make it big. So he he then goes on and he makes a case that television is almost predatory. Um, it kind of feeds off of our attention in a sense, and that that is absolutely true today but 
Um, it's it's back then. I mean, television was more of like an addiction. It it was still an addiction, but you had to be home to do it, right? You couldn't just pull out your television in your pocket, right? But he he says that uh, television shows what we want to see, as do all fictions and all lies of this nature, all uh, fictitious things. Um, TV is emotionally believable, yet logically not, right? It, it feeds off of our, it, it really feeds off of our natural, physiological emotions. It doesn't really feed off of our logic most of the time. You know, I mean, people will miss plot holes all the time in movies, right? Uh, but we we see all the emotions it's really any emo- watching tv is an emotional event right it's not really a it's not like you're watching a documentary right it's, it's very emotional so lonely people choose to be lonely and therefore tv provides a way of having a social relationship without being hurt um and this this is foster's words by the way um, so, so my take on this is that this kind of further, so like lonely people who, who want to be alone, they, at least in, in my viewpoint, they kind of, they want to be lonely. They, they choose to be alone. Um, and TV kind of gives them a chance to be well, yeah, like have that social relationship without being hurt, right? Um, and th- this is 100% true today with social media again. But it's also a kind of a thing like, you know, if if you're very conflict avoidant, you might choose just not to be in any relationships because you don't want to be in those. Uh, you don't want to be in anything that could lead to conflict, right? And TV allows you to do that. And that's that's part of the reason why it's so addictive. So and then and then uh, then Wallace says kind of that that the TV watcher is is a pseudo spy. Um, they they're not quite a spy, right? But that they are spying on people, right? Uh, fake people on, on the television. And then he puts out a number of illusions. One. The voyeur is really not a voyeur at all, as the actors in the screen are only pretending that they are not being watched. 2. What we see is far from stolen. It's preferred. 3. What we see is not people in real situations of people that could go on with consciousness of the audience. Fiction writers are studying fantastical scenarios. 4. We are not really seeing characters, but rather actors. And my. <laughs> it's funny because I was watching this show today. It's called Archive 81. It's really good. It's on Netflix. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm out here uh, telling you guys to go watch a, a television show while I'm about to heavily critique television. But, anyways, it, it's called Archive 81. Super good show. And today I was watching it with my girlfriend, and she points out that <laughs> that uh, she started talking about one of the actors. She was like, man, you really gained some weight for this role. And I'm just thinking, ah, you just canceled out the illusion for me. What the heck? You know, <laughs> like, you're not supposed to talk about the actor while watching the show. It gives away the illusion. No. Um, but yeah, uh, we're, we're not really seeing characters. We're seeing actors on a screen. And then five, actually, we're not even seeing actors. We're seeing pixels, right? And then six, and these pixels are literally a set of furniture. And seven, eight, nine, illusions go on and on and on. So, um, this, so I was, I think I started writing this like around Christmas time. That, uh, Christmas is kind of a fiction on top of a fiction on top of a fiction in the sense that um for one 
of course, like I don't, I don't have the sources of these right now. So just go, I'm going to make you responsible for going and checking, you know, fact checking me on this. But, uh, they say that, that Jesus Christ probably wasn't even born around Christmas time. He was probably born like in the spring. And, uh, What's that said? We're not even 100% sure if Jesus Christ was a real person. I mean, and then, then, uh, Christmas, like all the Christmas trees and the presents and the stockings and all that, all that is from pagan traditions. Totally just, uh, that's all pagan stuff. The only Christian part about Christ Christmas is going to church. But it was called Christmas after, uh, Christianity spread through Europe and then they had to kind of mix the two religious ceremonies the ceremony of the celebration of the winter solstice and the ceremony of the birth of Jesus Christ and they, they mix these together as Christmas so it's kind of a fiction on top of a fiction on top of a fiction and then I, I have this note in my in my notes, I say, bring up turtles all the way down and Nietzsche's myth of causation. And to be 100% honest with you, I'm not sure how that ties into everything quite yet. Maybe I'll think about it as we go, but I mean, <laughs> maybe think of the concept of turtles all the way down as in, uh, oh, fiction on top of fiction on top of fiction. Okay. Uh, okay, so so the myth of like turtles all the way down. I, I'm not sure if you uh, y'all have heard that phrase before, but it means like, um, say my grandmother she told me, "Yep, the, our whole earth, it is all sitting on top of a turtle." And I was, "Oh wow, uh, what is the turtle sitting on top of?" And then she says, "Well, on top of another turtle," and then. And then I asked, well, what is that turtle sitting on top of? She said, well, it's on top of another turtle. And then I asked, so what about that turtle? She's like, honey, it's turtles all the way down, right? Uh, you're never gonna, that, that's kind of the thing with like, it's always this fiction on top of fiction on top of fiction. You know, we can't really know everything about our past, you know, because we can't go back in time. It's it's always fiction, top of fiction, top of fiction. But okay, so and then uh, Wallace goes on to his next point. The actors are absolute gen geniuses of appearing to be unwatched. So normal people they they can't do this. They can't like <laughs> uh, when you see a normal person in a video, they they get all nervous. They're like you know fidgeting with their hands and whatnot. I did that in the last podcast episode that I posted on YouTube. You know, I was like fidgeting all over the place, right? But the thing is, they're acting entirely natural, which is in and of itself an illusion since normal people act unnatural, uh, nervous, etc. They, In Wallace's words, they, they spaz out. So he, he brings up kind of, he brings up Emerson and with withstanding the gaze of millions which is in the the book or the essay self-reliance which we've gone over on this podcast um he, he's saying that yeah i mean it's that's 100 percent true few are fit to stand the gaze of millions and then he goes on and he's uh so the only people who are confident enough to stand the gaze of millions to be self-reliant etc are lying and acting right <laughs> i mean yeah, I mean, the, the only people who can stand being watched are people who are acting. Um, people who are kind of not acting natural, right? And for us normal humans, you know, these people are kind of like demigods, right? And yet they're, they're liars. I mean, that's it, not in a bad way. Not in a bad way that they're liars, but they're, you know, they're actors and nature being actors, you know. You're, you're a liar, right? But the thing is, they're, they're people, right? They're, they're not demigods. You know, everyone takes a shit. Everyone pees. Um, that's just kind of a part of the, those illusions. And, and I think uh, 
you know, while television is way more enjoyable to watch when you're not thinking about, well, technically when you're watching television, you want them to be people. You want <laughs> the illusion that they're the, the characters that they're playing, right? Um, so we move on to the next section. It's called The Finger. Okay? Television is fun. It's it's exciting, right? I mean, it's awesome to watch television. I was watch that again. That Archive eighty one show is a really good show that I think everyone who has Netflix would enjoy. It's but the the thing is, it's it's a drug. Yet in in my opinion, it's kind of it's not really that much. It's less advanced. It's it's way more advanced, but it, it's not really that much different from books, imaginary scenarios, stories, etc. Um, it it is merely more so. In, in sin, it is more instant of a gratification, which makes it more so of a drug, unlike books, and imaginary scenarios, stories, etc. I think I think uh, in, in a sense. I don't know if I say this later on, but in a sense, uh, imaginary, you know, like when you're a kid and you're imagining stuff all the time, I mean, that kind of takes more work and like, it's all coming from within you. But, you know, as you kind of go further up the totem pole to hearing stories, then reading books, then watching television, it kind of brings you further and further away from your own creativity. It kind of in in my opinion, it kind of alienates you from yourself in many ways. Um, television is, in many ways, the opposite of self-reliance. Like religion, it either knowingly or unknowingly manipulates the masses. And also like drugs, uh, Wallace says that TV isn't even good. It's, it's, it's not even that good. Um... And with that said, it it uh, it creates this cycle of withdrawal and relapse, withdrawal and relapse, withdrawal and relapse. Because when you go and you're gonna go watch TV, you you kind of watch it, or at least many people they watch TV to escape the mundane aspects of their life, right? You you get off work and you just want to rewind and watch TV. Or unwind and watch TV, right? And it, it kind of turns into a cycle because you, you're watching TV, you know, all these, you're watching all these people unwind. And it's kind of like you, you're playing into a fantasy where, like, there, you know, there's a world where there's action, it's exciting, um, there's demons, right? There's like superheroes, you know, they, uh, there's like this other world where there's all this drama and action happening. And you're kind of just there, mindlessly watching it. And you're going to go to sleep. You're going to go to work. You're going to come back, watch TV. You're going to go to sleep, go to work, come back, watch TV. Over and over again. Um, and it just kind of turns into this relapse, withdrawal cycle. Um, so and then, quote, Better to believe I was a TV character than not to believe I was anybody at all. Wow. So, or what, what he means by that is that people desperately want to believe they are something greater than someone who sits on the couch and watches TV for six hours after working for eight hours at a job that they hate, right? And uh, the funny thing is, is that there's like this meta TV. So sometimes there is TV within TV where the audience almost becomes part of this inside joke of sorts, right? Like when you're watching, uh, what, like the the Wheel of Fortune, or or even worse, when you're watching, uh, like Deadpool and all the fourth wall breaks, and yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna pause here to try to make a comparison of TV to the human mind. Okay, okay, this is kind of okay. So I brought this up earlier. Um, so first we had imagination, then stories, then books and TV. 
Um, each of these alienated the individual further from their own imagination by having them rely on the herd or others or television for that imagination, right? And I'm just, I'm just going to be totally transparent with you guys. Like, I'm, I have this, you know, I wrote down this huge, like, script or whatever. It's not really, like, a script. It's more of, like, notes with words that I could. I mean, obviously, there's a bunch of quotes, but, you know, totally transparent. Um, this, this is a fourth wall break. Holy shit. Yeah, that, yeah, I have a computer sitting in front of me. I'm drinking Fireball mixed with, like, what is it? Dr. Pepper. Sugar-free Dr. Pepper. I've got the script, I got audacity, yeah, just total fourth wall break, that's what's happening, and you're kind of just here along for the ride, you know, I, I'm just going to imagine that you're there, and just, I'm sitting there, you're kind of like sitting there being quiet, and, then, and I'm just saying shit to you, right, um, but, but anyways, a uh, quote, this is, okay, this is probably the most important quote in the whole uh, book because it's kind of something that Mina kind of brought up um, in in a few of our podcasts together. But quote a dog if you point at something will look only at your finger. People do not look at what TV is pointing to, just at the television, right? Uh, people kind of stopped. I think a lot of times people kind of don't really see the messages, right? They kind of just see the action. Um, so then he gets on to the next section, meta watching. So people who protested during Vietnam, uh, Wallace begins, wanted not only to protest, but to be seen protesting on TV, the very same medium that they saw the war take place. So th this is very interesting, especially in the modern day. Um, People do this extensively today, right, through, through social media. People don't want to be in relationships. They want to be seen in relationships. People don't want to go places. They want to be seen going places. People don't want to do things. They want to be seen doing things. It is all to please the herd and to gain social status, right? It's, uh, it's, it's, kind of, it's really fucked up today with just how much... Just, how, you know, you'll be on Instagram... Or something, and then just people are so fake on Instagram. You're just looking at people, and you just know that they're just exaggerating their asses off, right? Uh, there's just so much illusion. Um, and Twitter is probably worse because, you know, there's no image. It's just a thought that they have. <laughs> uh, then Reddit, uh, it's debatable. I feel like Reddit does feel a little bit realer, in, in a sense, but anyways... So he, he makes a claim where television and fiction converse is self-conscious irony. And then he, he kind of has a few points. Um, one, it is ironic that television is a syncresis that celebrates diversity. Um, it, yeah, it celebrates diversity, yet, I mean, it's all just kind of a bunch of attractive people on television right it's only attractive people on television you know what's funny so uh I, I don't know where i was listening to this i completely forgot it it was on some podcast and they were talking about how no it was uh it was shoot i completely forgot his name but he's like this he's an asian comedian he has long hair he uh he wears glasses. He's he's pretty young. He has a special on Amazon. He's also appeared on Joe Rogan. I completely forgot his name. Maybe it was like Robert Lee. I'm not 100 percent sure, but he was saying how there's this movie called Great Wall, um, a movie based in like ancient China, and it stars it stars Matt Damon <laughs> like just some white dude right in the what in like in the early like i don't know when the great wall was like first constructed but yeah i mean it stars matt damon some white dude instead of what you know an, an asian person right just kind of yeah just totally ridiculous um and just super ironic 
And then, so he, he talks about how it, it is ironic that an extremely unattractive self-consciousness is necessary to create TV performers' illusion of unconscious appeal. Oh. Is that wrong? So, an extremely unattractive self-consciousness is necessary to create TV performers' illusion of unconscious appeal. Okay, so... Yeah, TV characters kind of seem like totally unconscious, like not self-conscious, right? Um, or I guess like we are totally self-unconscious, like unattractively so. And this kind of helps make it so much more appealing, right? And then he says uh, that, that the products presented as helping you express individuality can afford to be advertised on television only because they sell to huge hordes. Like, shit, man. Like, uh, and, and this was especially something in the 90s where, you know, they're saying how... To, today, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of the, the wokeness advertisements, right? Which, uh, you should check, so go check out uh, Carefree Wandering, the, the video on wokeness. Just type in wokeness, Carefree Wandering. I don't know what the name of the video is. Uh, and then you'll you'll find it, but uh, yeah, products that they say will help you express individuality can afford to be advertised on television only because they sell the huge towards. Yeah. So television regards irony the way the educated lonely regard television. Mm. Because it's something that you need, right? So uh, it, it both fears irony's capacity to expose and needs it precisely because television was practically made for irony. It was for kind of exposing all the things that are ironic. And you really see this on a... If you watch Seinfeld, um, I don't think he mentioned Seinfeld at all in here, but it is a very ironic television show. Um, that I suggest a lot of people to watch. Again, <laughs> suggesting to go watch television. Man, how, how ironic. Um, TV is not the replacement of radio, but rather the addition of video. And often what is said does not line up with what is seen. I.e., you know, there's plot holes. Uh, there's just a lot of inconsistencies when we're watching TV. So he, he brings up the example of the news. Um, with, uh, this guy talking about how, like, oh, yeah, there's, there's nothing bad going on here, and then he's, like, in some, like, terror-trodden, <laughs> like, third-world nation or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then he says that TV is a crisis for both culture and literature. It, it shows a false interpretation of reality, which then bleeds into how people think, act, feel, and write literature. So... Again, it's a, uh, it's kind of this fishbowl, you know. It's a, we're kind of a bubble, an echo chamber. TV aims to stir the passions, quote, stir the passions more than to gratify the taste. It's a dopamine thing, right? It's kind of a, it's all like nicotine, right? It's like you want nicotine more than it is even pleasurable to you to have it. Uh, that that is really kind of like how TV is or like even especially social media i mean you like a lot of times i like really want to get on social media but i get on and I'm like what the hell am i doing on this this isn't fun at all and then i'll like get off and then like 10 minutes later i'll go on and i'm like oh my gosh like what am i doing you know like i don't even enjoy going on it like as soon as you get on it it's like ah, i don't want to be on here anymore so, uh, television appeals to people by appealing to their animal nature, those parts of them that are vulgar um, and stupid, which many people have in common. I mean, we all have vulgar and stupid parts of us, right, that are in common. And I, I would say that the news is especially guilty of this. You know, they, uh, the news is basically tries to appeal to our fear and tries to appeal to really all of our animal fight or flight emotions, um, our anger, our fear. So uh, this is another reason why democracy is flawed and why the masses are idiots, right? <laughs> um, not individual people are idiots, but, but the masses are because the masses as a whole, they're united through their stupidity, right? But, like people aren't united through like 
their intelligence. They're united through their stupidity, through the parts of them that are like more animal-like, right? Um, so why one should be themselves and why self-reflection, self-reliance, and self-discovery is so important? Yeah. It's, it's important because if you're not trying to know yourself, you're not trying to be self-reliant, you know, you could really get swallowed up into the herd. You know, you can stop thinking for yourself. That's not, that's not what we want. Uh, television also gives without the need to receive. It is one way. Um, and this causes people to be bad listeners. It causes them to be rude, etc. It's much more like candy or alcohol rather than something that actually takes work to achieve. It's instant gratification. Um, it's kind of a sort of a visual mind masturbation in a sense. Um, it's very one way, like you're kind of just sitting there to enjoy it. And the TV is kind of just there. Um, I, I think this could definitely really make people more like selfish uh, and more, I mean, <laughs> out of one many, right? I mean, it could really turn people into, I guess like in a sense it could enhance individuality, but I think in a more deeper way it detracts individuality and kind of turns you into this drone of television. Um, but in, in small doses, okay, uh, it, it's okay in small doses, but sickening in large doses. It's downright neurotic if consumed almost as a nutritious staple. Um, imagine if everyone did it this way, and a lot of people do, right? Most people have social media almost as a nutritionist staple. That's that's mass psychosis, right? I mean, that's crazy. Um, DFW explains that something is malignantly addictive if, one, it causes real problems for the addict, and two, the addict uses the substance, the substance to experience relief from those problems, thus leading to a downward spiral. TV in particular leads to the individual becoming more and more lonely over time. As they use TV to seek relief from their loneliness and, uh, excuse me, and thus spend less time around humans while watching TV and also feeling less a need to push themselves to be real humans. So, people rely on the TV for social interaction, thus further limiting their social skills and desire to have social skills. People become dependent upon it. Um, he kind of uses a, an example, like he kind of uses Joe Briefcase as sort of the average person that watches TV after work for six hours. <laughs> um, so, quote, Joe, your only access to the real world is us. Joe uses it. Oh, wait, no, that's, I'm so sorry. That, that was my quote. I just said, Joe, your only access to the real world is us, the TV. Um, Joe uses the TV to see that there is hope and that his life could be lively. The life could be more than just working eight hours than watching TV for six. Joe gets his action from TV, and in fact, he gets his perception of what action should be from TV, right? He, uh, um, he, he not only, yeah, he not only gets action from TV, but he gets what he feels should be action, should be how people interact, right? And then uh, television offers both distraction, sublimation, anchoring, and isolation all in one big bundle of death and loneliness denial. Um, get your death denial here. Get your death denial here. Um, I can imagine uh, Freud's nephew, the, the father of public relations, of uh, modern advertising, to say something like that. So... Uh, Artistic television doesn't get good ratings because only the f few understand them, uh, right? Make art, not friends, right? Uh, Nietzsche um, writes a lot about how only a few people will understand greatness, as only the great understand greatness. Only few can be great, right? Because, uh, because what you find to be great is kind of a very unique thing to yourself, Right, what people find is great is unique to them. 
So, and with that said, there's not going to be that many other people who find the things that you find great as great as well, right? So only a few can be quote unquote great. So the last two paragraphs of this section read, quote, but it's still not fair to blame television's shortage of originality on any lack of creativity among network talent. The truth is that we seldom get a chance to know whether anybody behind any TV show is creative, or more accurately, that they seldom get a chance to show us. Despite the unquestionable, unquestioned assumption on the part of pop culture critics that television's poor audience, deep down, craves novelty, all available evidence suggests, rather, that the audience really craves sameness, but thinks deep down that it ought to crave novelty. Hence the mixture of devotion and sneer on viewerly faces. Hence also the weird viewer complacency behind TV's sham, quote-unquote, breakthrough programs. Joe Briefcase needs that PR patina of freshness and outrageousness to quiet his un his conscious conscience while he goes about getting from television what we've all been trained to want from it some strangely american profoundly shallow reassurance particularly in the last decade this tension in the audience between what we do want and what we think we ought to want has been television's breath and bread TV's self-mocking invitation to itself as indulgence, transgression, a glorious quote-unquote giving in, again not foreign to addictive cycles, is one of two ingenious ways it's consolidated its six-hour hold on my generation's cojones. The other is postmodern irony. The commercials for Alf's Boston debut in syndicated package feature, the fat, cynical, gloriously decadent puppet, so much like Snoopy, like Garfield, like Bart, advising me to, quote-unquote, eat a whole lot of food and stare at the TV. His pitch is an ironic permission slip to do what I do best whenever I feel confused and guilty. Assume inside a sort of fetal position, a pose of passive reception to escape comfort reassurance this cycle is self-nourishing unquote there's so much to pack out of here right uh so we, we don't really get a chance to know if the people buying tv are really creative you know like the, the networks are so much in control of stuff and that, that's kind of something that um makes me feel a little bit more optimistic about our, our modern day is that, you know, like YouTube channels aren't really controlled by networks, right? They're, they're to totally creative, right? Um, and a lot of the stuff on Netflix, I feel like that's not really, uh, I feel like the stuff on the streaming services are seem a lot more creative than the stuff like on regular television, because for for one they're not really making it to get views they're just making it like almost because they can right to uh get people to get netflix uh, to make people like it um that, that's kind of one thing that really makes the shows on netflix or amazon a lot better than the ones on regular television right so then he says uh that uh people use television to almost get reassurance right they get it to kind of feel like oh like I, maybe i'm not as lonely as i thought i was you know and he says that uh particularly in the last decade uh this tension in the audience between what we do want and what we think we ought to want then television's breath and bread so yeah we we kind of use television in a sense to kind of get what we feel like we ought to want, right? Rather than kind of what we do want in a sense. And it's kind of this self-nourishing cycle of reassurance. So that kind of just makes it a drug. Okay. 
Guilty Fictions. Um, I'm pretty sure this is probably the longest section. Um, I, I know I wrote a lot on it, so be ready, right? <laughs> the conflict between what people desire and what they feel they ought to desire is nothing new. So people do what they feel they ought to be doing, um, or people doing what they feel like they ought to be doing is a form of modern repression. TV, the news, etc., all reinforce it, right? Because uh, in a sense, uh, in, in people kind of like over time kind of start to become more actors, right? There's not a whole lot of people that are good at being their authentic self around everyone else. Um, because when you're your your authentic self, people get pissed off, right? <laughs> They're like, shit, like I, I didn't want you to be your authentic self. I just want you to lie and be nice to me. Um, and that's, that, that's the thing, you know, you, you can't expect people to do that, right? Uh, pop culture references, brand names, etc. made people united, not by beliefs, but by what they have seen, right? So, uh, uh, you know, you'll, you'll hear people say, have you seen Lost? What? You haven't seen it? You, you have to watch it. You have to watch it, dude. What? Oh, you haven't seen Star Wars? What? You, what the fuck? You, you haven't seen... Like, what, have you lived in a cave? What, are you deprived? What, you weren't allowed to watch Spongebob when you were a kid? Holy, oh my gosh. Yeah, you, you, you see people doing this, like, all the time. And I, I'm guilty of having done this, too, you know? Like, people want to be united by what they've seen, right? Um, not by what they believe. Sure, they, they do want to be united by what they believe, but they feel like they ought to be united by what they've seen, right? Because they don't want to talk about what they believe. Uh, so Wallace, quote, In fact, pop cultural references have become such a potent metaphor in U.S. fiction, not only because of how united Americans are in our exposure to mass images, but also because of our guilty, indulgent psychology with respect to that exposure. Put simply, the pop reference works so well in contemporary fiction because, one, we all recognize such a reference, and two, we're all a little uneasy about how we all recognize such a reference, unquote. So this is, will really heavily tie into uh, the episode that I will do on symbols and the interpretation of dreams by Carl Jung. Uh, that, that'll probably come after, uh, what is it, uh, self-understanding by Carl Jung. Self, the unexamined self by Carl Jung. I I don't remember the title, but but yeah, it all kind of comes into play how we uh, symbols are something that really unites people. But anyways, uh, th this is like when you're watching a reboot or a remake, and one of the actors from the original show comes in, and everyone cheers. Right? Wait, I like this, but should I? Right? Uh, like when I was watching the new Star Wars movie. And then Han Solo came on, right, as this old, you know, Harrison Ford. <laughs> Everyone in the theater, including me, <laughs> yes, I'm guilty of it. We, we all just started, like, cheering, right? Like, oh, yeah, it's Han Solo. Like, what the fuck? That's awesome. Um, so Wallace states that the usage of, quote, low references in today's literary fiction, on the other hand, serves a less abstract agenda. It is meant to, one, help create a mood of irony and irreverence. Two, to make us uneasy and comment on the vapidity of U.S. culture. And three, most important these days, to be just plain realistic. So that is, uh, low references serve to help both appeal to the masses and also loot more people under their belt. This relates back to my last episode on making on the making of all people equal, or all things equal. In that, low references and lower forms of art, such as televisual culture, and especially how it is today, um, hook our attention, however so little, and appeal to all those things that most people have in common. For the most part, it makes people realistic in the sense that it lowers their options for what they feel they could be doing instead of watching TV or scrolling on your phone for six hours a day, right? Uh, so, so Wallace, uh, he, he then, he, he brings up the idea that when the TV was first popularized, it was simply looked at rather than lived with as it is today. He says, quote, 
Our elders regarded the set rather as the flapper did the automobile, a curiosity turned treat turned seduction. So uh, th this thought relates heavily to the two episodes I did on Kaczynski's Industrial Society and its Future, and that when a new technology is introduced, it is not at first required or even really all that useful. The new technology is simply an accessory that not all that many people have, nonetheless don't really feel they need or want it all that much. And it is only when these technologies are popularized that they become almost fully integrated into everyone's life and culture as a whole, that one, in this case, uh, people would feel ostracized if they don't have it, right? Or if they don't use this form of technology. Let alone with everyone else using this new technology, you have to use it in order to even begin to compete with everyone else. Right. Don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Right. <laughs> you're going to you're going to get shot. You know that, you know, you have to be able to compete with everyone else. So if everyone watches TV or YouTube, etc., then you'd be out of the loop everywhere you go if you didn't either. So uh, uh, <laughs> here's a little thing that I wrote. Alas, we've invented fire. And the other guy says, who needs fire? What's wrong with you? What? You're know, like, what's wrong with the sun, right? Jump a few thousand years later and everyone is cooking their food from now on. If you don't, well, go back in the trees, shithead. So, Wallace, uh, he likewise mentions that we, quote, literally cannot imagine life without it. <laughs> so, now, now keep in mind that this was written before the popularization of the cell phone, before people could even conceive of the smartphone. So, imagine not having maps, Google, etc., to help you get where you are going or find out anything when you're curious. Most people could not imagine life without their smartphone. I was going to bring this thought up later. However, I think this all relates to death repression and modern society's increasing fears of death. As we become more and more used to having something and thus alienated and intensely far removed from losing it, the fear of losing it becomes far worse. In modern society, we put the sick and old in hospitals and homes. So we don't have to see them. We don't see wars play out, people dying in the streets, etc., etc. And thus, we are very much isolated from death and suffering in the modern day. Having it good instills fear and resentment into the masses. TV, then, uh, it further contributes to the alienation from death and distracting us from the horrors of life. Sure. A lot of TV shows use death as a form of entertainment. However, it is twisted into something fun and exciting or artistic rather than something horrifyingly traumatic. Um, it's, it's a sublimation in a sense, right? For our distraction. So, quote. Um, he, he says something about identity when he says... Uh, in our post-1950 inseparable from TV association pool, brand loyalty is synecdotic, synecdotic of identity and character, unquote. And indeed, as our reality shifted to be almost inseparable from TV, social media, etc., we begin to attach our identities to those things that we are hooked on, right? Um, now, what comes to mind to me when people say, uh, quote, you are what you eat, is the almost better metaphor, you are what you consume. I am Doritos, I am Nike, I am the Democratic Party, I am Donald Trump's speeches, etc., etc. Nietzsche mentions that, quote, there was only one Christian and he died on the cross. The church sort of predated television and radio, both obviously literally and in the sense that the church offered yet another consumption of stories, thoughts, ideas, etc., that turned the many one Christian body, or the, the many into one Christian body, right? More so, the one Christian, namely Jesus Christ, existed as a martyr and, quote, seed for the growth of many pseudo-Christians. Uh, that is, the Christians that came into being by consuming Christianity rather than being truly Christian in that being a divine free spirit who dies for the sins of all humanity. So Wallace, uh, he, 
he makes a good statement on how the cultural zeitgeist has further self-propelled itself through TV with, quote, We are also now self-defined parts of the great U.S. audience and have our own aesthetic pleasure centers. Television has formed and trained us. It won't do. Then, for the, liter the literary establishment simply to complain that, for instance, young written characters don't have very interesting dialogues with each other, that young writers' ears seem tinny. Tinny they may be, but the truth is that in younger Americans' experience, people in the same room don't do that much direct conversing with each other. I mean, how many times have you been to a party and, uh, you know, people were just, like, on their phones, right? <laughs> it's so... It's so infuriating, like when you're just out at dinner with someone and they're just like on their phone and it's like, dude, do you want to be here, like hang out with me or do you want to be like in the, on Instagram, right? So uh, people are beginning to write characters almost as they really are, boring, right? TV further pulling us into its clutches almost keeps us from conversing amongst ourselves in a sort of repressed, quote, I don't have anything good to say and especially nothing good to say to you, so let's just watch TV fashion. It, f it uh, further, I think, um, this is perhaps the most dangerous aspects of entertainment in general in that it makes us feel further alone, which is something that Wallace brought up in the beginning of his essay, out of one, many. It does not unite us, but rather divide us in that people are not even closely or even remotely united by what they see. People united what they think, feel, and believe. Rather than uniting us, TV divides us into separate individuals by connecting us through superficial, sensual means rather than intellectual, empathetic means. Why talk to each other when this can talk for us? <laughs> now, that, that's just like the creepiest thing of it all. It's like, why should we talk to each other when this can talk for us? right that's i mean i guess like you're listening to a podcast right now but i doubt you're listening to it with someone else uh unless you're like driving in a car or something right but uh if it, people are united by what they think feel and believe right uh that said uh um as a sort of breaking of the fourth wall I, i'm currently choosing to talk to you talk to a not to you, but I'm talking to a lifeless microphone instead of a human being, while you are choosing to listen to a speaker instead of a human being. Do you feel connected to me? I'm sure you do, however, not in the way you feel connected to your best friend or to someone you've really experienced something with, right? Um, that's Okay, so that's kind of like when you see cults, right? But I think the biggest appeal to a, a cult... Um, is that they kind of allow you to experience these, like, really experience things with other people, and they give a sense of community. And I think that's the thing that people get so attracted to them by. But uh, anyways, that's kind of a side note. So uh, Wallace, he, he references Voltaire's Candide in a way that I did not quite expect him to, in the sense of, like, I, I think he could have... Um, uh, he, he gives an example of irony without exploiting its message, so, uh, Candide is, it, is it, it's largely a story about the protagonist Candide and his associate Pangloss. I don't know if it was his, like, teacher or mentor or whatever, but they, they travel the world looking for the, quote, best of all possible worlds. Now, c correct me if I'm wrong, but Pangloss believes that the world they live in is always the, quote, best of all possible worlds. But Candide does not believe him and thus embarks to find the best of all possible worlds. Everywhere they go, however, is marked by war, famine, and otherwise horrifying scenarios. One mistakenly attributes Pangloss as the optimist in that he always thinks that we live in the best of all possible worlds, and Candide is a pessimist in that he thinks that this world is terrible. However, Candide is actually the optimist that he always thinks that it will get better while Pangloss thinks it is as good as it is ever going to be. If we relate this to mass culture, the Panglosses and Candides of the world are both addicted to TV. One says that there will be one day that life gets better and I won't have to watch TV anymore, while others says that there simply isn't anything out there better than TV. 
while their life is in chaos and they either use hope or simple complacency to deal with the harsh, boring reality of their life. Now, I'm going to read quite a long section, um, as is likely one of the most important passages in the essay, and it concludes this section on guilty fictions. So, um, just as you're listening to, you know, you might want to listen to it like twice or like three times through. It's a really, it's a really important part of the essay. Um, and, and kind of be thinking of the old, pro, old English proverb, um, proverb, uh, when, when a tree falls in a forest and there's no one around to hear it, um, d- doesn't make a sound. I don't know, right? The, so, quote, the true prophet of this shift in U.S. fiction, though, was the prenominate Don DeLillo a long-neglected conceptual novelist who has made signal and image his unifying topoi the way Barth in Pinchon had sculpted in paralysis and paranoia to a decade earlier. The Lilo's 1985 white noise sounded to fledging fictionists a kind of televisual clarion call. Senlets like the following seemed especially important. Several days later, Murray asked me about a tourist attraction known as the most photographed barn in America. We drove 22 miles into the country and around Farmington. There were meadows and apple orchards, while fences trailed through the rolling fields. Soon the sign started appearing, the most photographed barn in America. We counted five signs before we reached the site. We walked along a cow path to the slightly elevated spot set aside for the viewing and photographing. All the people had cameras, some had tripods, telephoto lenses, filter kits. A man in a booth sold postcards and slides, pictures of the barn taken from the elevated spot. We stood near a grove of trees and watched the photographers. Murray maintained a prolonged silence, occasionally scrawling some notes in a little book. No one sees the barn, he said finally. A long silence followed. Once you've seen the signs about the barn, it becomes impossible to see the barn. He fell silent once more. People with cameras left the elevated site, placed at once by others. We're not here to capture an image. We're here to maintain one. Can you feel it, Jack? An accumulation of nameless energies? There was an extended silence. The man in the booth sold postcards and slides. Being here is a kind of spiritual surrender. We see only what the others see. The thousands who were here in the past, who will come in the future. We've agreed to be part of a collective perception. This literally colors our vision, a religious experience in a way, like all tourism. Another silence ensued. They're taking pictures of taking pictures, he said. End quote. So he, he goes on to say that he, he he quoted it in such length because for one it's it's too good not to and for two it uh draws your attention to two relevant features. And he says, quote, the less interesting is the Dobsonesque message here about the metastasis of watching. So not only are people watching a barn whose only claim to fame is as object of watching but the pop culture scholar Murray is watching people watch a barn, and his friend Jack is watching Murray watch the watching. And we readers are pretty obviously watching Jack, the narrator, watch Murray watching, etc. If you leave out the reader, there's a simple regress of recordings of barn and barn watching. And then he says that, uh, the, that the more important is the complicated ironies at work in the scene. It's obviously absurd. Um... And the, the writing's par- 
parodic force is directed at Murray. Um, quote, the would-be transcender is speculation. Murray, by watching and analyzing, would try to figure out the how and whys of giving in to collective visions of mass images that have themselves become mass images because they've been made the objects of collective vision. The narrator's extended silence in response to Murray's blather speaks volumes, but it's not to be mistaken for a silence of sympathy with a sheep-like photograph-hungry crowd, unquote. So I myself quote this in such length because, one, I myself am contributing to these layers upon layers of watching in that I am watching, or more so reading, Wallace Watts de Lilo's imagination of this watching upon watching upon watching, etc. It is by far probably the most important part of the essay. We're, we're not here to capture an image, we're here to maintain one. Boom, right? De Lilo essentially summarizes culture and civilization and indoctrination, etc. All in two quick sentences. The idealists who praise that we will, um, quote, make the world a better place, do not actually want to make the world a better place, but rather maintain the image that they do want that, right? They feel they ought to want to make the world a better place, but they instead want to merely seem as if they want what they feel they ought to want, right? The, the average American is no different. Now, uh, relating this to Orwell's 1984 and Huxley's Brave New World, we see that control is not about what one does, but rather what one does in order to maintain the image that they do, that is, a ruler who seeks to control should control through images and symbols. Um, men do not create their symbols or their culture. They merely maintain the images of these. We cannot see the barn, only the shadows of it. Right? In connection to Plato's allegory of the cave, we see that this thought is not original. DeLillo, in fact, is almost maintaining the image of Plato's allegory rather than creating a new one. What was culture of the real world before we started observing it, right? Uh, it is like asking, does a tree really make a sound when it falls if no one is around to hear it? Yes, it does, but it doesn't matter. We are in it now, and there is no way to return. As the very act of observing the tree makes the question itself impossible to answer. For instance, when a human being jumps in a lake, they feel as though they are in a totally different environment totally new and totally different environment and feel all the water around them. Fish, on the other hand, probably don't even realize they're in water at all. So the, the maintenance of illusions, illusions, and fantasies is not only important, but necessary in the maintenance of the existence of society and civilization itself. Likewise, creating a distinct difference between what one feels they ought to desire from what they actually desire by manifesting a repressive sort of guilt within them, further self-containing and self-perpetuating all of this. So, then we go to this section, I do have a thesis, which I, I quoted the whole thing because, I mean, I should just, I felt like I should just quote his whole thesis, right? <laughs> uh, th this part, which is in two paragraphs, um, reads, quote, I want to convince you that irony, poker face silence, and fear of ridicule are distinctive of those features of contemporary U.S. culture, of which cutting-edge fiction is a part. I enjoy any significant relation to the television whose weird, pretty hands has my generation by the throat. I'm going to argue that irony and ridicule are entertaining and effective, and that at the same time they're agents of a great despair and stasis in U.S. culture. And that for aspiring fictionists, they pose ter terrifically vexing problems. My two big premises are that, on the one hand, a certain subgenre of pop conscious postmodern fiction, written mostly by young Americans, has lately arisen and made a real attempt to transfigure a world of and for appearance, mass appeal, and television, and that, on the other hand, televisual culture has somehow evolved to a point where it seems invulnerable to any such transfiguring assault. TV, in other words, has become able to capture and neuralize any attempt to change or even protest the attitudes of passive unease and cynicism TV requires of audience in order to be commercially and psychologically viable at doses of several hours a day. 
So with that said, I think I'm going to leave that off as part one of this series. And uh, don't worry, I'll post part one and part two like pretty close together. Because uh, like I, I so just to be straight with you guys, I've been doing. I start. I decided that I'm just going to do a podcast every other week, just because um, that that gives me more time for my personal life to, for one, give you guys more quality content. Um, instead of just doing interviews all the time, you know, I can do more, uh, of my own lectures and whatnot. And two, it gives me more time to write, um, uh, because I am a lover of writing. Um, I, I'm actually writing a book right now. It's called On Death and God. It is about kind of how, uh, we, we really fear death. I mean, fears, I mean, death is kind of like in, in my own understanding of it it's kind of the first fear right um, in the absence of you know the threat of imminent death we kind of start to really think about death right we, we start to almost fear it more because we're alienated from it and there's not all all that much i mean a, a lot of people kind of get trapped behind this fear they get trapped because they've repressed this fear instead of dealing with it right but anyways i, I i've been writing about that um and anyways go uh, go check out my website into dash the dash absurd.com and have a wonderful rest of your day afternoon evening week whatever and i will see you later Goodbye.